So welcome everybody to Colloquium and uh, to a new year, a new start of the Colloquium series. You should all know uh, to check Canvas. So there will be uh, quizzes for each Colloquium on Canvas that will become available at 3.30, the day of the, uh, uh, the, day of the Colloquium, and will remain uh, accessible until 3.30 the following week, the following Friday. You need to complete these quizzes in order to show that you came to colloquium, that you engaged with the colloquium, and that you are benefiting from this experience to justify the expense it takes to bring in these fine speakers uh, to share their experience and their research uh, with us. So uh, without further ado, I will turn the time to Jamie Callan, who will introduce our speaker. All right, it's my pleasure to introduce you and Dai. Uh, June is from Google Brain, as you can see up here, Google Research the Brain Team. Uh, she's a, an LTI alum. Many of you probably know her. She finished up here about two and a half years ago, just as COVID was happening. Um, I think I, it's fair to say that this is probably her favorite LTI colloquium because she doesn't have to do the test later. Okay, and she's here voluntarily, so we told she has to come. Uh, so June uh, did wonderful work while she was here as a graduate student. Uh, she was part of the introduction, really, of neural technology to the search world. It had been happening for a while in speech and in uh, natural language processing, but in the search engine uh, era, uh, search engine world, uh, it just had not, it hadn't been anything good. People had published papers beating bad systems, uh, and so, you know, like, like machine learning beating a system that used no machine learning, uh, and so no surprise there. Jin was with Jin and John was one of the first people to really be a good feature-based learning to rank system, and that really changed the way a lot of people in the uh, in the IR world and the search community or the academic search community viewed neural techniques. It really sparked a lot of interest in it. Uh, she also did work. Uh, she did work on uh, early work on using the uh, BERT for re-ranking. Uh, one of the first people to do that. She also did work on using uh, neural techniques to generate term weights that could be put back into the older retrieval models to make them more competitive, which is something that people hadn't really done before. Uh, it was kind of a, it was a new idea. Uh, so she really had a giant effect uh, on her, uh, as she finished up her PhD and then headed off to Google, where of course now we know not a lot about what they do because it's all secret. Um, but she's continued to publish. She's worked on uh, turning documents into dialogues and uh, Q-Shot learning uh, and other things, so we'll hear about some of that today. So I'm really excited to have her back. We like to bring back students who have graduated, you know, a few years ago, um, so that you can get a sense of what your careers might look like, uh, you know, a couple of years after you finish your PhD. So I'm really excited to have you, and I'll turn things over to her. Thank you, Jamie, for the introduction. Um, hi, I'm Juying, and I now work at Google Research, the brain team. So my team and my research has been focusing on knowledge retrieval, how to improve knowledge retrieval, and how knowledge retrieval can improve downstream tasks such as question answering and conversational assistant. So today my topic is retrieval meets large language model, unlocking new capabilities. Um, we know that retrieval and generation are two main themes in natural language understanding research, and both of them has wide range of applications. Um, retrieval, we use it every day. We use Google search to, uh, or Bing to search for a restaurant or products. We search for videos to look at. We also search for articles where, for us to do research. Um, for example, here I'm showing, we, if you want to do a research in supply chain management, market size, you could just Google search it and get some facts about it. Um, meanwhile, recently we have seen huge paradigm shift with the new generation models, such as ChatGPT. Um, and it let us know how things could change. For example, instead of doing my research by issuing Google search queries on the search engine, I could just ask ChatGPT to make a slice for me about market opportunities for supply chain management. And it will write a well-written, convincing passage about the global supply chain management. Um, so we see both of them having wide applications. Retrieval, we already know, and generation, we're expecting to see more and more applications. 
But on the other hand, we also s it's obvious that these two are complementary, and their potential has not been fully realized when used together. Um, for example, in the generation world, something we know, a long-standing problem, is the hallucination. The generation model sometimes generates unsupported, misleading, or outdated information. And on the other hand, we can trust a retriever because it always tells us what this knowledge is from, come from, we, who wrote this article, where it belongs to. And it's easy to add, edit or delete knowledge from a external knowledge base with the retriever. The question is, can retrieval make generation more interesting, accurate, and trustful? There has been a lot of research on this topic, um, such as the retrieval augmented language model lineup research, um, where we can use train a retriever to retrieve passages to generate better question answerings. And more recently, we have these models such as WebGPT and Lambda, which directly just cause an external search engine before they generate the response. Um, in today's talk, I will propose a new paradigm that we use to post hoc attribute what a large language model says to external evidences as another way to use retrieval for augmenting large language model generations. On the other hand, why we're amazed by generation models? Because it, one thing, one reason I think is it generalized very well. Um, we see it can do zero-shot learning, it can do few-shot learning, it can take a very simple instruction and do the thing you want on your input. And if you give it examples about reasonings, it can also do new chain of thought reasonings on new examples. When we look at these magics and look at back at our retrievers, we see most of the retrievers still rely on in-domain pre-trained fine-tuned recipe. And for a retrieval builder, it needs a lot of efforts to collect data, um, write code, and train a good retriever for your new task. And we're wondering, can we bring some of the magics that we saw on the generation to the retrievers to make the retrievers more generalizable and easy to use? So that's the two main questions. I want to give some initial results in today's talk. And we're going to see what will happen when we use them to, when we use retrieval and large language models together to unlock some new capabilities that we haven't seen with older models. So the first part of this talk will focus on how we build generalizable neural retrieval with large language models. Um, I assume many of you already know that in today's work, um, neural retrieval has been in significantly improved over the past 10 years maybe, and dense retrieval models have shown great percent progress on semantic search and open domain QA. And the way, the way we use it is we train an encoder that can encode document and queries into dense embeddings. And at test time, we store the document embeddings into an index, and for every query, we encode it and retrieve the k-nearest neighbors from the index to get the relevant documents. And at training time, we collect relevant query document pairs and we use this um, classic two-tower model where we have a query encoder and a document encoder, and we try to minimize their distance. Um, this works very well when we train this in-domain, outperforming previous state of art, which are like DM25, like SQL retrieval systems, or feature-based machine learning models. By al it almost doubled the accuracy with such a recipe. However, not for all the retrieval tasks we have training data. There are many tasks that we want to do retrieval. For example, for fact checking, we want to retrieve um, evidence that can support a fact. For uh, some deduplication work, we want to retrieve similar text and remove the duplications. And there's a huge uh, wide range of applications in biomedical IR as well. Um, it's not easy to collect training data for all of these and train in the due in two-tower models for every one of them. So a question in our mind is, can we just train one, one model and use on all of these tasks? Um, this beer paper from NeurIPS 2021 proposed this benchmark called beer, which is uh, a zero-shot heterogeneous retrieval tasks, where they have 18 data sets from different domains, such as biomedical, Wikipedia, Twitter, et cetera. 
and we were testing how these models gen, uh, perform in the zero-shot setting on all of these tasks. And surprisingly, we found that none of these neural models can outperform a BM25 model that is purely TF-IDF based and has been used for several decades. Um, this graph shows on these 18 tasks the, how many tasks the, a neural model can perform better than BM25. And as we can see here, the ones that are circled in, are in this red circle are these dual uh, encoder models. And they all fail for more than half of the data sets. Um, this clearly shows a limitation of the generalization ability of dual encoder models. So in the first paper I want to present is the large dual encoders are generalized for retrievers, where we want to address why dual encoders doesn't generalize well and how we can improve it. The obvious assumption we have is that maybe dual encoders are bad because they are limited by a fixed embedding dimension. Um, unlike the generation models where we always have every token's representations, hidden vectors at each time step, for dual encoders, we're training the model to compress all the information in the document into a 700 dimensional embedding. And while we're training this compression function, we, are, we might be overfitting to the training data. And when we use a new document, the model just don't know what are the important information to encode into that embedding. Follow this assumption, there's one direction of research that uses multi-vector retrieval to break this bottleneck. Um, instead of encoding every document or queries into a single embedding, they encode queries and documents with multiple embeddings, or even <coughs> just store all the token embeddings for those documents. And this works very well, both in domain and out of domain. However, this causes significant inference cost, because now we have to store maybe 100 times more vectors for um, our document corpus. So we ask ourselves, is fixed embedding size really the bottleneck? And we have some proof to show that, no, there's still headroom for these models. And the proof is distillation. Um, one trick people have been using to improve dual encoder models is to train a cross-attention teacher that takes the con concatenation of query and documents, send it to a transformer, and just learn a classification head on top of the transformer so you'll know whether they're relevant or not. Um, surprisingly, that model genera generalized very well to new tasks, and then you can just distill this model to your dual encoder uh, architecture, which can serve efficiently. And that is a lot better than just fine-tuning your dual encoder on the same set of data. So we know dual encoder can be good if they're trained with good distillation data, but we do not get the game by just uh, fine-tuning it in a vanilla way. So seeing the scaling loss of the transformers in many NLP tasks, we're wondering how the scaling law apply to retriever as well. And that's the main topic of this paper. We're scaling up the backbone encoder of uh, these dual encoder models, changing from T5 base to T5 3 billion model up to T5 11 billion model. And we train all of them using the simple uh, vanilla recipe where we have a question and a document and we minimize their dot product. The other question is, um, with the scaled up models, does this capacity allow us to give more information and supervision to this model and improve generalization ability? Specifically, does it benefit from better pre-training? So for this question, we propose this two-state training where we take our two-tower model and we get a web data set, which is quorum Reddit that we mine from the web that are, looks like in the QA format and we pre-train our dual encoder on those. And then we fine tune it on human annotated search data. Here is the result. Basically, I want to show the scaling law here. Um, the, green, the blue curve is how this dual encoder model scales with, uh, at different model sizes. And um, we're reporting both the recall at 100 and NDCG at 100 on all the VR tasks. 
here the setup is we, pre -tra we train this model on MS Marco, which are the human annotated data, and then we zero shot test it on all the beer tasks that I just showed before to test its generalization ability. Um, and as can be seen from this figure, we clearly see that scaling up consistently improves steel encoders out of domain performance. Um, this is great because this means as the models grows up and become bigger, we can easily transfer the gains to retrievers by just using a simple pre-training and fine-tuning recipe. Um, with this ob observation, we create this model called GTR and we release the checkpoint and that has become a baseline for many follow-up works on this zero-shot dense retrieval setup. And we have seen many improvements after the GTR paper. There is like contrastive pre-training, like the contriver that pre-trains the model in a more unsupervised way on the entire web. There is new retrieval architecture that do not use dual encoders, but um, sparse retrieval or multi-vector retrieval, um, which are like the Splade V2 and Cobert, which are showing significant improvement over the GTR. And also we have some work on synthetic query generation that hopes to generate synthetic queries for the new domains so, uh, and train retrievers on those synthetic data to make it more generalizable. Um, we're excited to see many works pushing this zero-shot benchmark further. However, we noticed that something might be missing from all these previous experiments. Um, specifically, as you can see, all of those research are using a zero-shot transfer setup. And implicitly, they all assumed that it is possible to generalize a retriever from one task to all the rest. And the question is, is this assumption always true? While we look at the beer data set, we see the retrieval tasks can be very different. Um, for example, in favor, we are retrieving claims that can verify uh, we're retrieving evidence that can verify a claim. Or, and in DBpedia, we're retrieving entities. And in Aguana, we're retrieving counter argument that uh, contradicts a existing arguments. And why do we assume that a model trained on MS Markle or natural questions can generalize well to all of them? If we follow this setup, basically we're training a model on our existing training data. And fingers crossed that it can work well on all the rest. So in the next paper, we call it Prompt Gator. We are challenging this assumption and we argue that it is important to work on few shot retrieval tasks instead of doing zero shot transfer learning. And we show that it is possible to train few shot dense retrieval from just eight examples. Um, to more formally define the task, now we define a retrieval task to be a tuple of a collection of document D, a set of a distribution of queries Q, that we may know uh, or <coughs> we may know a few queries from. And then there is this intention, which is the underlying search intent people have under this task. Or in other words, the definition of relevance between a query and the document. Um, for example, in question answering, the intent could be find passages that contain the answer. And in argument retrieval, the intent could be find counter argument, arguments that counter these arguments. And as we said, without instructions or any examples, how can a model know what intent this task is uh, intended to be? Then the question becomes, um, how many examples do we need for a model to know what is the new intent and what the task is? If we need a lot, then we go back to the route that we collect data and pre-train and fine tune. and it's expensive and efforts taking. However, we want to explore if a few examples are sufficient to learn a task specific retriever. And in this paper, we propose this new task called few shot retrieval, where we see the contracts from previous work where uh, either previous work are either unsupervised or supervised from Maracle or natural questions. So the key idea of this, our model is to transform form a few examples into many more examples by prompting a large language model to generate the data instead of using those eight examples to train a retriever directly, which will cause significant overfitting. And the process is very simple. We first generate synthetic data with a prompt-based query generation by prompting a large language model. And then we do round-trip filtering of the synthetic data. 
um, which fil basically filters out the bad generations. And then we use our synthetic data to train a retriever using standard recipe. And more specifically, um, assume we have k examples um, for a new task that comes in the form of query and doc relevant query and document pairs. Um, what we did for the query generation is we prompt a large language model with the following string prefix, where we concatenate those k examples into a single string. And here, we wrap every document and query with a function e, which are the query and document descriptions for this specific task. For example, in Aguna, we would do argument document and counter argument query. So basically, you get a string that just can kind of all your query document examples with some description to the task. So the model knows what it is supposed to do. And the last doc, d, is a new document sample from the collection. Um, of the corpus that we need to, to retrieve in. Um, and this out model will output a new synthetic query for the document that share the same style and intent of your examples. And that is our synthetic data. We run this prompt on all documents and we can create a much larger training data than the k examples we get, but they share similar distributions. Here I'm showing some examples, um, contrasting how this few shot model generates queries, uh, how it's different from a zero-shot generation. So this is from the Aguana data set. We're given the document, which is a very long argument. If we use zero-shot generation, that uh, a model we train on natural questions, we got these very short queries, like what did they try to ban, or is skin whitening resistant? But this doesn't follow the task we need to do on Aguana, where we are supposed to retrieve counter-argument that are, which is a long article. But with FieldShot, um, clearly we can generate a counter argument that looks like the true document that we need to retrieve. Um, similarly, on HotPod QA, your task is to generate multi-hop questions, and uh, you need to retrieve passages for those multi-hop questions. Um, to create synthetic training data for it, if we do zero shot, we won't be able to generate multi-hop questions. Instead, we're generating natural questions, style questions, like how old is this house? Um, but if we show the model some examples and the instruction to generate a complex multi-hop reasoning question, it will generate something that is more like the true distribution. And the rest is straightforward. Um, we might generate bad examples, and we want to filter them out. And the idea is the consistent round trip filtering where for any synthetic question generated from a document, we think this synthetic query should retrieve the document back. Otherwise, it is likely to be a very generic or noisy question, and we want to filter it out. The specific steps are we first train initial retriever on the unfiltered synthetic data, and we filter a query if the initial retriever gives a low score to its source document meaning that this question cannot retrieve its own source document back. And then by doing so, we can filter a significant amount of the synthetic training data, and then we train our final retriever on the filtered version. The similar idea of consistent round trip filtering has been explored in question answering, but uh, previously we kind of need the filter to be trained on gold data. Like if we want to filter um, questions based on answers, we need a very good question answering model. And I, I think one thing surprising we found in this research is that actually your filter can be just trained on your original synthetic data. And it can filter itself very well. Um, we have some more analysis in paper showing that how this approximates a EM progress where you have some latent variables as the um, retrieval scores um, and how it can converge at some point. But then we have our filtered data, then we pre-train our do encoder on some corpus following existing pre-training recipe, and then we can fine-tune it on our filtered synthetic data. Um, by doing so, we can create our model called Promptigator, um, which is a do encoder. And we also train another model, Promptigator++, which is a do encoder plus a cross-attention rate ranker that are both trained on this synthetic data. And here are some results. Um, I'm showing a lot of baselines here, but 
they can majorly be categorized, categorized into two categories. One is unsupervised, which means they do not use any human annotated data. And those are BM25 and Contriver on the upper part of this graph. And then we have those models supervised by MS Marco, and we were hoping that they generalize to all the rest of the tasks, which are GTR, Splayed, Covert, and some query generation models like GenQ and GPL. And finally, we have our model, Promptigator, where we try both zero shot and few shot. Um, so first, zero shot, it's not bad. It's already better than a lot of the baselines. And here, our zero shot does not use any MS Marco. It relies purely on the language model to generate queries based on document without instructions and examples. Um, the gain we get from zero shot shows that um, synthetic data from a large language model already is of high quality um, and can train good models. The, few sh the gap between the zero shot and the few shot are the task specific information we're adding to our synthetic training data. Um, and as can be seen, this helps many of the tasks and improves the performance of our retriever. When we do this same recipe on cross attention re-rankers, which are not dual encoders, which they are like high expressive transformers that has the concatenation of query and documents. Um, initially, we were expecting the gain to be smaller because we know cross attention models generalize better to new data. However, here we're seeing that actually we get still significant gains by using the synthetic data generation. And this model works much better than um, a vanilla approach that you just scale up a T5 re-ranking model trained on MS Marco, which are the mono T5 3B model. So the key message here is that with our model, it's very simple three steps. You generate synthetic data with a few examples and you train your model um, with some filtering in between. And it's better than all the previous methods that use much complicated recipes such as synthetic data, uh, such as uh, more slower models or distillation. And I think that just shows the um, power of few shot learning. And that's why this task is a value task. The next, next question we want to answer is does few shot always improve over zero shot? We have seen the examples where uh, we compare zero shot exam, uh, query generations with few shot query generations and we see we are able to generate more in-distribution queries. And here we qualitatively compare this. We found that few shot always improve over zero shot, except for one data set, the climate favor, which I circled in the red circle. And we, when we look at this data set, it's very interesting because the data sets um, isn't well defined in our analysis. The task needs to retrieve evidence to support or contradict a claim about a climate um, topic. But then in the beer data set, they, mi they mixed the supporting evidence and the contradicting evidence together. So it's very hard to write a good prompt for it. And our field shot prompt just got completely <coughs> confused by whether it should generate a contradictory document or a supporting document. So that's why its performance is even worse than if you just simply ask a model to generate a question for this article. Um, again, this shows few shot will improve over shot if we have good examples. And we believe it's, it doesn't take much effort to collect good examples of just eight. The other analysis we run is can generate queries replace human annotations? Um, and we run this analysis on MS Marco where we do have huge amount of um, human annotations. The blue curve I'm showing here is the supervised model which is trained on human annotations with different amount of data. And the orange curve is promptigator trained only on eight examples with synthetic data generation. And we can see that with few shot synthetic data generation we can um, get a lot of the gains from the human annotated data. It's like 50k thousand data can be replaced by just eight examples. This is great because it means that for us to train retrievers or maybe other machine learning models, um, we do not need to collect 10,000 of data points now. We only need to write eight good examples and then ask larger models to generate those. 
that will make model iterations a lot faster and cheaper. Finally, some qualitative analysis on how the query generation distribution differs from um, few shot, uh, from previous query generation models. Um, and here we're showing the first words of the queries that for every data set. And for the gold queries on this um, Aguana data set, the most frequent words appearing at the first sentence is the, a, uh, it, there, is, if. And if we do NQ, QJ, if we train our query generation on natural questions, we would generate completely different questions that starts with what, who, when, and where because of the natural questions data set distributions. And previous research were basically relying on this model to generalize to this new task, which is, again, we prove it's wrong. And with FieldShot, we do generate much better in distribution examples. And more interestingly, in the four example that we gave to this um, data generation, uh, our large language model, we start with while wow, it knew the, so it's not the exact distribution of the gold queries that we're giving as the few shots. However, um, our model kind of figures out the, what the task is, that it needs to generate counter argument, and it is able to generate a much larger synthetic data sets that are more close to the gold distribution. Um, so that's the few shot learning retriever with uh, synthetic data generation. And in the next uh, part, I want to show how we can play this synthetic data generation game even further. And that is this paper called Dialogue in Painting, where we try to turn documents into dialogues, also through prompting large language models. Previously, we have been focusing on a lot of retrieval tasks, but most of them are single turn, where we have a query and we return a document. But we believe for some intent, we do need dialogues. For complex questions like how can I eat healthier, we cannot provide a single answer to this. Instead, we need to understand what is your current lifestyle, what foods do you like, do you have any budget or health conditions. And um, for different scenarios, we would respond with different results. Um, so people have been trying to train conversational question answering models or conversational search models. But all of the progress have been um, slow due to lack of good training data. This is because it's even harder to collect dialogues for retrieval and question answering. Um, there are some sources that on online that we might use. For example, social media. We have large amount of social media data that are cheap to obtain. However, the, their quality is questionable. They sometimes contain misinformation. They doesn't cover enough topics, and we don't always have the alignment between a uh, social media chat to the evidence or documents behind them. The other approach we can take is to hire people to generate such data for us, which we can guarantee they are high quality because we can train our crowdsource workers to generate good dialogues. However, these are very expensive and we can only afford to collect a very small set of those. And again, because of the small amount we can collect, we can't cover many topics. Then the last resource we have unlimited documents online that are large, that are cheap to obtain, and we can um, ensure the quality of those documents by only selecting documents from trustful resources, such as Wikipedia. And they can cover many topics. Um, the only issue with this is that they are not dialogues. And can we transform them into dialogues? In this work, we showed a smart way of transforming documents into dialogues. Um, on the left, I'm showing a passage from Wikipedia. And we assume that when the writer writes this passage, he has an imaginary reader in the mind that is asking questions. And the writer is communicating to the imaginary reader by writing this article. So what we're doing is we're reconstructing what the imaginary reader would be asking to this writer. Um, more specifically, we're taking every sentence from this article, assuming that it's one turn in a dialogue, and we're predicting what the other people would ask to this writer. Uh, so here, the dialogue we're reconstructing is that, hi, I can answer your questions about a healthy diet. And then we take the first sentence, a healthy diet is a diet that maintains or improves overall health, and we predict what the 
imaginary reader would be asking, and here our question is, what is a high, healthy diet? So by doing so, we can take sentence by sentence and insert what the other people is uh, asking in this dialogue. And by doing so, we can create a dialogue specifically for this document. And uh, we have perfect alignment between every turn in this document to part of the a source uh, evidence. So how we do that? We train a model called, we call it dialogue in painter because it impaints a turn. We train it using a dialogue reconstruction loss where we take real dialogues from social media and we randomly blank out utterances. And then we simply train a model to predict what is the masked out, uh, utterance. And this model is trained on real dialogue data. So it will always generate a term that reads like a dialogue term. But when we use it, we replace the other dialogue terms to be sentences from a document. Um, this model will try to still mimic a user in a dialogue and ask questions or um, generate responses. So by running this on all the Wiki English Wikipedia, we create a huge set containing 11 million information seeking dialogues based on Wikipedia passages. And we run human evaluation on this data set to uh, check its quality. And our human evaluation shows that this synthetic conversation we generated by converting document to dialogues is on par with manually collected ones um, that are from Oracle or Curac, which are human collected conversational data set. The question we ask our human readers are, are these dialogues information seeking? Are they conversational? And are every term well answered? And on every single aspect, our dialogue is on par with some of the curated uh, manual dialogues. Then we take this uh, wiki dialogue where we have every turn and we train a conversational retriever on that. Um, and we compare on three tasks which are QREC, ORAQUAC, and CAST20, which is the conversational uh, search track, um, and compare with previous SODA. And we see that we simply get new SOTA on all of these three different tasks with uh, a simple recipe that pre-trains on wiki dialogue and fine tunes on um, some of these tasks. So QREC and ORAQ have fine-tuning data. And for CAST, we simply fine-tune on QREC and apply to track CAST. Um, previous state of art have to do a lot of extra work because lack of data. For example, they need to do reinforcement learning and distillation. Um, well, in our model, again, we show that with the power of synthetic data, you don't need to do complicated recipes. All you need is converting document into dialogues, train your model on that. So some discussions. Um, after some of our research, now we start to see more and more exciting work on using large language models for retrievers through instruction tuning and prompting. Um, some work we are seeing are tuning instructable retrievers um, that are look like Flam, where you can actually give it instructions or few shot examples at test time and retrieve better documents. So those are some work from Meta, such as task aware retrieval instructions. Um, also, we have paper from CMU where um, the approach takes a GPT-3 to generate a synthetic document um, for every query and just retrieve with that synthetic document. Um, and you can talk to the authors here, Louis, to more about that art, um, paper, which is quite interesting. Um, so we're very happy to see that this few shot instructable retriever task being uh, also recognized in the research community. Um, the other point I want to mention is the synthetic data generation. We have shown how powerful it is for both few shot learning and for the conversational retrievers and we're expecting it to take more um, and more roles in developing all NLP models. Um, basically, we can treat our large language model as a teacher that generates data for training faster student models. And it's not limited to retrievers, from my opinion. So that's for the retrievers. Now let's talk about while we have better retrievers, how we can improve large language models in return. And here I want to address the issue that I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, where large language models tend to hallucinate and generate misleading information. And here we're uh, discussing our work to improve the large language model attribution with retrieval. Um, 
So most of the large engine models lack a built-in mechanism for attribution, meaning that once when the model generates something, we don't know if it's true, correct, or false, and we don't know why this model says it. Um, it's hard for user to decide which part they should trust for this large large model because the lack of attribution. Um, some work, such as retrieval augmented language models, do provide a certain extent of attribution by first retrieve some evidences and then generate responses by grounding on those retrievals. However, what we found is um, these models often ignore retrievals, so it doesn't guarantee the attribution. And if we force the model to be fully grounded on the retrievals, their generation will be less interesting and less creative. Um, so in this work, we want to help people decide which parts of a large language model's output they should trust without hurting the interestingness and creativeness of a large language model. And the approach we're proposing is called researching and revising what language models say using language models, and we call it raw. And this work is also a collaboration with Louis Gao, who is a uh, student from LTI, and he did intern in our group in the summer. So instead of doing retrieval augmentation before the generation, our approach is a general purpose post hoc fact checker and editor that takes whatever a language model says and post hoc finds attribution for the text and revise parts of the input that are unsupported based on the evidence that we retrieve. And while doing so, we want to preserve the original input so that we don't hurt all this um, interestingness in the original large language model outputs. Um, so as shown on this graph, we take a text generated from a model and we do research and revision. We retrieve attributions that can support this um, input text and we also generate an attribution report telling our user um, why each part is attributed to external evidence. The implementation of raw is very simple again. It requires a handful of training examples, a large language model, and we use standard web search for our retrieval. Let's first um, define the task in a better way. So let's say our input X is the text produced by a generation model. This generation model can be ChatGPT, can be Lambda, can be any generation models. And we want to output two things, number one, why a revised text based on X that we hope to fix its unsupported parts um, while preserving its uh, original intent. And number two, a attribution report, which here is a set of evidences, one, uh, E1 to EM, um, which provides evidence that can support claims made in Y. And how we evaluate this task? This is a new task and we don't have any benchmarks or metrics. We define our metrics to be two things. We want to evaluate how the attribution part of the model as well as how we preserve the original text. So for the attribution, we use um, NLI models basically to evaluate how each evidence supports our um, revised text Y. And uh, we have some better defined definitions here that you can check later. And we also ask human readers to uh, evaluate whether each sentence is supported by this set of evidence A in the attribution report. Similarly, for the preservation, we propose a auto-evaluation and a human evaluation. For auto-eval, we can take a character level edit distance and use that to, as a metric of how much we change from the original text to the new text. And for human evaluation, we ask humans if the revision changes the original intent. Um, and uh, we do some gating here for human evaluation. So if the human says it completely changes the intent, the, uh, we got zero score. But if the human says it doesn't change the intent, we again look at the edit distance to, pre to penalize unnecessary edits made by the model. Um, so these are just two metrics that we can use to um, measure the quality of our model. And finally, we report F1 AP, which is the harmonic mean of the attribution score and the preservation score. 
this is analogous to how we get F1 for recall and precision. Basically, it tells us how much we balance between these two um, metrics, attribution and preservation. Because there could be a trade-off that we, the more we change, the better attribution we can get. Now let's look at our model. Um, RAW is a research and revision model. And in the research stage, the goal is to automatically find attributions for the input X. Um, so the first step, we do a comprehensive query generation for this input X. We ask a sequence of questions that covers all aspects in X that may need attribution or may need fact checking. Um, and the prompt we use are shown here. Basically, we are showing the model a passage and list all the questions that we could ask to fact check this passage. And uh, this is the prompt, and if we use it on new passages, we will get a list of new questions that we can use in Google search. So for evidence retrieval, we take the questions generated from our comprehensive query generation and uh, retrieve five URLs for each of the questions. Um, and then we use the existing ranking model to select the most relevant passage from each URL based on the question. So now for every question or every aspect of the claim that we want to check, we collect five evidences and that makes our attribution report. Once we have all these evidences, we went to the revision stage. Um, we have an agreement model to first check if the text disagrees with the evidence with regard regarding to the issue in Q. Um, so it's a question guided entailment model where we are showing a passage and the evidence and a question um, guiding the model to focus on one aspect of the claim that we want to verify. Um, if we, our agreement model thinks this evidence district agrees with the text, we run the next revision model. Otherwise, we just do not edit. And for the agreement model, we use few shot prompt with chain of thoughts to reason the entailment. And here, basically, the reason is um, you said something and the evidence says something and they disagree or agrees. Finally, for the edit, we similarly run a few shot chain of thoughts prompt that takes a text, a evidence, and the question that the model needs to focus on and generates a revision. So with these three simple prompts, um, we can chain these components together and the, build the raw system, um, which doesn't need any fine tuning or training. Then we want to evaluate this model. Before that, we need to create a benchmark for evaluation because we don't have, uh, this, tar this is a new task. Um, we, our purpose for raw is a general purpose fact checker and editor for any text that a large engine model might say. So we create, build our evaluation data sets with that. We prompt several generation models to produce long form outputs that may contain hallucinations. And we run raw on that to check how much we can attribute and fix those outputs. Specifically, we build three sets. One is a factoid statement where we're prompting a large language model to answer natural questions with, a, with explanation. So it's a long form output instead of a short answer. And it sometimes <coughs> contains wrong facts. Similarly, we prompt our model to generate reasoning chains by answering a strategy QA questions, which is like, can someone reach the uh, peak of mountain Himalaya? So you need to do some reasonings and math to answer this question. Um, and finally, we have conversational intensive dialogues where we prompt a dialogue model to generate responses for based on previous terms. Um, and this becomes our test sets. We run our model and, and some baselines on these three data sets. And we, here we report our attribution score and preservation scores um, and the F1, which balances these two metrics. Um, EFEC is a fine-tuned model trained on Wikipedia to do retrieval and editing. Um, and here we can see EFEC did a reasonable job in improving the attribution score, like from 45.6 to 64.3, um, but it changes the output a lot. So the preservation score is very low. Similarly for Lambda, which is Google's retrieval-based language model, we use it for the editing task by asking Lambda to take our initial, prom uh, initial out take the claim and do retrieval and rewrite that claim. 
And uh, similarly, the attribution is OK, but edit is sometimes can be large, and the final F1 is low. And finally, our model Rob, because we prompted it so it can generalize well to new data, unlike EFEC that is only trained on Wikipedia. And um, with the components that we say, like the agreement gate, we prevent over editing and have a very high preservation score while also good attribution score. So in conclusion, Rob did a reasonably good job attributing a evidence and editing a text to external evidences while it has a strong ability to preserve the original output from a larger grant model, making the response more interesting. Here are some examples to illustrate those metrics to make it more exp uh, intuitive. So if our input X is justice, justice headed the seventh central pay commission in India, it was created in 2014 and submitted its reports in 2016. Um, based on our human evaluation, this attribution score is 50% because there's one claim that is wrong, which is the year 2016. And if we do no edit, the preservation will be 100%. And as we can see, the prior work, such as EFEC and Lambda, changes the input a lot. So their preservation becomes zero. And sometimes they don't fix the um, text either. So their attribution score can sometimes also be zero. While our model can um, minimize the parts that needs to be fixed, preserving the original text, and make it grounded to some external attribution scores. Here is just a graph, sh again showing the metrics of how we balance attribution and preservation. Um, these contours are, uh, for each contour, it's a F1 score between the attribution and preservation. So, as we can see, our baselines are either biased towards having high attribution or biased towards having high preservation, while raw is at a better contour that ha uh, has, a, in general, a better F1 score. Here are some examples of how our model performs the research and revision. Um, I'm showing one win case and one loss case. Here, we're performing a necessary large revision where we're changing um, many parts of the text, but these are necessary changes, and um, because Rob does its revision iteratively, it will check every sentence, get the evidences, and uh, fix claims one by one, and generate a fully attributed part of the text. In a last case, I'm showing that um, our model improved attribution, but the reasoning doesn't adapt to the new information. This is something interesting because we're using this large language models not to just generate um, factoid, factual claims. We're asking it to generate reasonings or write essays or stories. And um, with our local editing, we sometimes broken the reasoning chains or the stories inside the text. And here is exactly one example um, where our models, we ask the model does Homer Simpson needs two hands worth of fingers to count to five? And Homer Simpson has four fingers for each hand, so it do needs two hands to count to five. Um, but our model originally says it has, uh, he has five fingers, so he only needs one hand to count to five. While we do find evidence saying Simpson only have four fingers, and we do fix that, saying Homer Simpson has four fingers, but we don't change the rest of the reasoning, and uh, we're still saying, therefore, he does not need two hands. Um, a better version of this model would be to rewrite the entire statement based on the new facts. Um, and we believe some prompts can do that, and we're working on that. So that's the two part of the research I wanted to show today. And finally, I want to um, discuss some of the, the thoughts we have and some of the <laughs> future work that we're interested in. So we have seen retrieval models and generation models improve significantly over the past couple of years. This talk represents our current research on how they can be used in combination to unlock new capabilities. Specifically for retrieval, we're looking at how large language models, magics can be brought into retrievers and make retriever um, smarter, generalize better, and be able to take few shots and instructions. Um, 
In this talk, we discussed how scaling long retrievals better, how synthetic data generation can ease the training recipe for retrievers, and how these, these things combined allows new capabilities for retrievers, such as training retrievers with just eight examples, or the more recent research that can um, build instructable retrievers or um, few shot retrievers at inference time. And for generation, we're trying to address the issue that generation models sometimes hallucinate. And we propose this new editing for attributing task, new automatic and human evaluations for that. And we show a model that we simply prompted it to do this task, which does well and outperforms previously supervised models. Um, so that's the existing work we have. And an important research question we have for future research would be how do we seamlessly integrate between generation and retrieval? Right now, we're improving one using the other, but at some point, we would want them to be seamlessly um, coordinated and integrated that while we do, maybe while we do generation, we can automatically show the citations instead of us doing all these post hoc retrievals, or we can show links that you might want to read while we generate an essay for you. And also for retrieval, how they can better retrieve things based on hum instead of us coming up with keyword queries, how can they better take us our natural language input and find the evidence that we need for us? So yeah, that's it for today's talk. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> and any questions? Good time for a few questions. So I have a, a rather egocentric question. It's about what I'm interested in as opposed to what you're interested in. And it has to do with the, uh, um, with the uh, building dialogues out of uh, expository prose, right? You know, and there seems, there's a really interesting idea behind this, if I understand you correctly, which is latent within uh, like a expository prose then there are questions, or there are, there's a dialogue, basically, underlyingly, and you only get one half of that on the surface. This is really interesting if you view prose as being basically dialogue with one half missing. But uh, um, I wonder, what would these, uh, this other part, this other person in the dialogue be different, depending on the kind of, uh, of document or the kind of prose you're looking at? For example, would there be a difference between like a, a Wikipedia article where you're sharing information and a persuasive article where you're responding to arguments, perhaps, one by one? Have you thought about that, or have you, did you look at anything like that? Yeah, that's a cool question, and we actually tried this. Um, and we do found the model will generate different styles of responses based on the document you provided. Uh -huh. For Wikipedia that I show you in this talk, it usually, generate, for the other user, it generates very formal questions. Uh -huh. Like, what is this? What year it appears? But if we give it a, like a recipe or a music review, um, the generation for the other user will be more, uh, less formal and right. more chit-chat-like. Oh, um, this is because we train the model on all the like, online forum dialogues. Uh -huh. And there's a lot of different styles of dialogues there in the forum. Right. And the model is basically looking at one side and guessing what the style for the other side will be. So if it's, if it's based on like social media forums like Reddit or whatever, then I would sort of expect sometimes the other user to say, no, you're wrong, or to <laughs> give counter arguments to what, you know, and does that happen? Um, I don't see ex like exactly this case, like counter argument. But I do say sometimes it, it's not questions, it's a statement. Right. Yeah, it's something maybe else. The other side might say, oh, I like that as well. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. We only release wiki dialogue because we get legal approval for that. Right. Ac but actually, we can run this on all the web and get all different styles dialogues.
and like that's already a challenge. Like you see with the Google info box and stuff like that. Do you ever think that that you know that that uh, verification of the quality of the rewriting source needs to be baked into the model as well, or is that something that you kind of think should remain? Good question. So at this moment, we make it a separate post hoc module. One is for like you can plug in it onto any like large language models, and the other is um, it can be used offline as a automatic metric to decide how attri how attributed the response is. But I do think for um, a better version that can run online efficiently, this should be baked in into the recipe, and maybe some reinforcement, I'm thinking some maybe some reinforcement learning can do this because our approach basically gives you a metric or reward function of how, how factual a claim is. And then this can be used to encourage model to generate more grounded responses. Thank you, Thank you. great question. Um, Good question. So um, those tasks, the corpus do overlap um, for some of them, and but the questions are not exposed to our large language models. So our model sees the document, but it never sees what are the corresponding questions. Um, and at retrieval time, we were assuming like the corpus is given and asks model to generate new questions. Yes, we have details in the paper, but we do truncate our passages to be, I think for each one at most, it's maybe 500 words long, and the total context length is about 4,000 tokens. Um, I think recent models can go up to 9,000 tokens. Um, but yeah, how to handle even longer input is still a question. So, uh, like in one of the papers, you selected eight examples to prompt LLMs to generate the synthetic data. So how were you selecting those eight examples? Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't heard the... So uh, in one of the papers, you were selecting eight examples to prompt the elements to generate synthetic data. So how were you selecting those eight examples? In this paper, we simply take the first eight from our a, a random shuffle of the training data set. So we're not picking them carefully. So how is it like performing better than 50,000 annotation data? It's... Um, that's a good question. Oh, so we're picking eight, but we're generating much more than eight. We're generating a million. So we're comparing actually a million synthetic data points to 5,000, uh, 50,000 human annotations. Okay. So, yeah. Yes, so one thing is um, using eight examples is better than not using any. Like if you just ask the model to generate question versus you give eight demonstrations, demonstrations will help a lot. And then how good the quality of the demonstration needs to be, we didn't carefully study that. Um, we, randomly, we randomly pick, but I think a much detailed instruction about the task and a much better manually written examples will help the model to better capture the task um, and generate even better examples. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine p just putting the instructions you give to your human readers into this language model. It should be generating um, good quality data that is on par with human readers or even better. Instructable models. Yeah. <laughs> other questions? Is useful or not? Just 
Yes, I didn't do the experiment, but uh, there's related work looking at the emerging abilities of large language models. And we first see in-context learning from, I think, FLAM, which has 100, over 100 billion parameters. Um, and before that, like T5, they, don't, they, are not, they cannot do in-context learning very well. Um, but I think this is changing because people are training, for example, in the FLAM T5 paper, we're training the T5 with instruction um, data sets, like we're instruction tuning the T5. And with that, it can do in constant learning with just 11 billion parameters. So I'm expecting, um, right now we have to use larger models, but later we could use much smaller models for this. Thanks. All right, let's thank uh, Julian, and you're welcome to uh, join us for snacks and uh, come ask her more questions uh, when we get over there. So thank you. Thank you.